Welcome to another episode of Mission Compliance, Unleashing Growth Potential for Defense Contractors. I am your host, Roman Gennaro. On today's episode, we're diving deep into the world of defense contracting and uncovering the secrets to winning lucrative contracts. Join us as we explore the strategies that set successful defense contractors apart from the competition. Discover how they leverage their strengths, build strong relationships, and stay ahead of industry trends to secure those highly sought-after contracts. Get ready to gain the competitive edge and position yourself for success in the world of defense contracting. Let's dive in. We're joined once again today by Mike Frieder, president of On-Call Compliance Solutions, a CMC registered practitioner and a CMC certified professional assessor. Thanks for joining us, Mike. Yeah, it's my pleasure, Rowan. Good to see you again. So, Mike, in previous episodes, we've talked about the difficulty that a business may have in identifying the right fit for their defense needs. This week, we're going to talk about what it takes to win. Winning a contract is just that. Winning. It's competitive. So, what are the key strategies that that successful defense contractors use to gain a competitive edge in their industry? Great, great question. So, I think that there are uh, a lot of a lot of different sort of angles that I could take with this, um, and and hopefully we'll get to a few of them during the podcast. So I'll I'll sort of start with one, and then um, you know we'll we'll kind of branch off from there. So um, I think you know if you're a defense contractor and you're looking to win more defense business, my personal recommendation, and I've seen a lot of people who you know, have even started as small as one person and landed you know, into billion dollar contracts. Uh, I think the first thing that I would do is number one, make sure that you're ready for growth. Um, you know, If you've got a well-oiled machine in terms of your operation, uh, your accounting is okay, your people are okay, you've got a good core business going on right now and you desire to grow, no matter how small you are, um, the next thing you really have to do is you've got to make sure that you're ready for more defense work. And part of being ready for more defense work, of course, is being compliant. Um, You know, even if you've won some work before and you've kind of skated by, the reality is the larger the, uh, the larger the contracts get, the more DCMA or the Defense Contract Management Agency brings scrutiny to those contracts and gets involved. And the more they get involved, the more likely you are to have a NIST audit. Um, you know, and, and in the future, that'll be a C, CMMC certification audit or something like that. So I think the first thing you've got to do if you want to get a little bit bigger is you need to make sure that you have a good foundation under you to stand on when you do get bigger. So the last thing you want to do, and believe me, we we take care of people who are in this position all the time, is go out and win a multi-million dollar contract and then figure out later that you have to be compliant and it's a freak out bull rush to try to solve this problem. That's when excessive spending comes in frustration, your people, instead of being focused on servicing the client that you just won, uh, you know, are, are ultimately now focused on just making sure that the core of fundamentals are actually in place that you said were in place. False claims penalties come in. It, you know, it's just one of those things where the reason why the law is, um, that you're supposed to have NIST SP 800-171 and DFARS compliance standards met before the contract award, and in fact, actually before the solicitation is issued, is because the government wants to know you're ready to do business with them. So um, I always say the best thing you can do, even if you're a micro small business, okay, we've got affordable programs you can you can call on call, and you know we can help you with that. You know, a promise of price point is not going to put you out of house and home, uh, particularly for some of our micro guys, you know, that, that have concerns over that. Um, I know we're the cheapest alternative in the market, so I'm not really too worried about that. We do market research all the time. Ultimately, what it boils down to is you got to be ready. You have to be ready for growth. Um, I think there's a a, a saying that relates back to um, there's no such thing as luck. There's just being in the right place at the right time, uh, which is lucky. And to be in the right place at the right time, you've got to have a business that's prepared for that luck to happen. So, you know, as a great example, we've been in business for 20 plus years. And we've had a lot of lucky things happen to us, but none of those things uh, are things we could have taken advantage of if we had not been ready for them. So one, it starts with being who you say you're going to be on that contract, which is a compliant contractor. Um, you know, 
And again, I also sort of mentioned having your accounting practices in good shape. If you don't know what that means, it just means that things in QuickBooks don't look funny and you're prepared to account for the things that you're obligating yourself to in the contract, especially if it's firm fixed price. Um, I think another reason why it's so important to just get compliant before you're really doing a large amount of defense work is because, uh, especially if you're a larger company, this can be a great expense. You may have to put in new IT and cyber solutions. You may have to put in major changes to your physical facility. Uh, as a matter of fact, actually, we were dealing with a company not too long ago. They had a massive facility. And to secure that facility was going to be a seven-figure expense. And they were on a firm fixed price contract. I mean, that hurts. You've legally obligated yourself. You've got DCMA and DIDCAC assessors showing up at your place about halfway through the contract, and you know it. And then you just got a million dollar surprise about what it's going to take to run door access and cameras through your facility. Think fast. So, um, you know, government contracting isn't like the private sector. And I think you can't treat it the same. And so you do need to know what you're getting yourself into. Um, I think the other thing is partnering. You need to partner with companies. And I'll just throw on call out there as a as an example. You know, we partner with defense contractors to help them understand what their obligations are if they don't know or they're not familiar with defense contracting. You can call us anytime and talk with one of our certified compliance experts to get those answers. And we don't even charge anything. It's just part of our getting to know you process. So uh, one is I think the first step to success is being ready for success in defense contracting, knowing what the law is and being compliant so you can take on that work. I would say that's probably number one. All right. I, uh, I want to modify that lucky statement just a bit. I think luck is being in the right place at the right time. What happens after that is up to you. 100%. Yeah. I think, 100%. yeah, I think that's, I think that's the, 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 the easy way to look at it, but I think what happens to you may, may very well depend upon how prepared you were for it. Right. So no, exactly, exactly, exactly. Speaking of having competitive edges, one way I think a contractor can do that is, is, is by knowing who they are as a company, as a contractor, as a business, their own strengths, their own weaknesses, their own offerings, what they can do. How do defense contractors identify and leverage their unique their unique strengths to to stand out in in the bidding process? It's a great question. So, in government contracting, a lot of times it all starts with a capability statement, and I think um, a capability statement. You know, in private business, when you go networking, uh, you're told you should have an elevator pitch. You should probably have a 10 second, 30 second, one minute elevator pitch. So, if you stepped into an elevator with somebody, could you tell them what you do and what your unique selling proposition is? within anywhere from 10 seconds to 60 seconds. Defense contractors are the same, except they do it in a more formalized fashion with something called a capability statement. Capability statement is a single sheet of paper. Usually it's only on the front. Sometimes you go front back and it describes what your capabilities are, unique, your unique selling propositions and your uh, past experience. So if you're listening to this podcast, you're new to defense contracting, or maybe it's just been a really long time and you haven't really looked back at your capability statement, uh, any any salesperson who is directly selling to the government or in the government space to private companies like uh, any of the big, you know, the big main defense contractors, Rock, Lockheed, Raytheon, et cetera, polish up that capability statement, right? That's kind of like, here's my business card, but in government contracting. Um, I, I think that's the first thing is let's make sure that their first impression of you is a great first impression. And, you know, you get a business big enough and you start really appreciating consistency and a capability statement is the leave behind. They may not re remember every word of that conversation when they get back from that trade show, but they will absolutely have that capability statement. So if you have the best looking capability statement, you're probably going to get a lot of a lot of really great response. Um, I think another thing that I would really focus deeply on is remembering that unlike traditional forms of marketing, OK, unlike traditional forms of marketing where you can go throw up some Google AdWords or some Facebook AdWords and, you know, really find your audience out there on the Internet. I'm not saying you can't do that. All right. But there are uh, God, this is one of the other reasons I just love the defense industry. All right. Defense industry loves to do business in person. They like to shake hands and kiss babies and actually get to know the person on the other end of the table. Around the country on any given day, there is a trade show in the defense industry where you can go and meet people from these various branches of government. Here's the wild thing. You ready? Their job is to connect with small business and put money in your direction. 
Love that. That is the government. And you know what? If you don't take advantage of it, shame on you. Um, you can't afford the plane ticket? Go get a credit card. Like, sorry, guys, but like if you want to make moves in the defense industry, you're going to have to take some risks. You're going to have to get on a plane. You're going to have to show up and you're going to have to shake some hands because that's how defense does business. They do it in person. Um, you know, don't get me wrong. I think you need to have a really good online presence as well. But I think that is a big difference. You know, the modern day economy has evolved to be all on the Internet. You can you can shop for anything on the Internet. You don't usually go shop for a tank on the Internet. Right. And you're certainly not going to shop for a bunch of tanks on the Internet. You know, or whatever, whatever your defense service is. And, and I'll tell you, we've had to learn that lesson the hard way. All right. So from full transparency, um, you know, we've had to learn that lesson the hard way. You can't just go out and do this stuff out on, out on the Internet. You know, you've got to show up where your clients are. You know, you've got to be ready with those capability statements and you've got to be ready to have real human interaction, which I feel like is a lost art these days. Right. <laughs> um, but for those people who show up, I mean, here's a hint, right? Who's got the biggest booths at trade shows? Well, the biggest contractors do. Is it because they got more money? Well, I don't know, maybe, but they probably got that money because they knew that that's where to show up. So here's another hint is go look at in-person events and who's going to them and see if those people are your target audience. Um, and, and finally, I think the, the final point that I'll make, God, I, I could spend an hour on a podcast just talking about trade show marketing. But um, I think the other thing is, You've got to remember that the people in procurement from big primes and defense contractors, they're just human beings like you, okay? But the difference is they've got orders to fill. And so if you have recently gotten compliant, this is maybe, I'm going to give it away right here for free on, on this podcast, all right? Number one tip that we give to sales managers when we work with them uh, on compliance and how to use it as a competitive selling advantage is, for goodness sake, get every single person on your sales team. And if you're a business owner, like if you're a small business owner, you're listening to this, I'm talking to you. Pick up the phone of everybody that you got in your QuickBooks file or your CRM system who's ever bought from you before a defense-related product or service. Call them up and tell them that you got compliant with DFARS NIST and you're ready for CMMC, all right? So if, if you've done this, I've literally helped our clients land multi-million dollar contracts right in front of my eyes. I told the sales managers on day one of our consultation, by day three, they came back and said, we got a bunch of orders in. They were psyched. They're shifting their entire XYZ division to buying from us because their other subcontractors haven't called them to tell them that they're compliant and getting with the program and we're nervous about it. Okay, They need you to be compliant, but you need to tell them that you did it and that you jumped through the hoop for them. That's a relationship, okay? That's what a business relationship really is. Hey, I got a challenge. I need a compliant supply chain. Hey, you know what? I heard your call. I rose to the challenge and I went and did it. Now, I'd like to ask, do you have any more business to send my way? That, that statement, that principle alone for most businesses is worth millions. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Um and this this may seem like an obvious place to take this, but I think another important factor in remaining competitive for for big contractors is to stay current in the defense landscape. If you don't know what's going on right out there in front of your face, you're not going to you're not going to get the big the big business because you're not paying attention. So how do defense contractors stay updated with the latest trends and requirements in the defense industry to maintain a competitive edge? Well, I got to tell you, Roman, I, I guess I'd have to do a little bit of uh, self-promotion for your division because I, I knew it was going there. <laughs> if, you know what? If, if you haven't gotten on YouTube and you haven't gone to youtube.com slash at on call compliance, uh, it's free. Subscribe to it. And we took care of that for you. And you knew that you knew that was coming. So mm -hmm. I appreciate the setup. But, um, you know, I, I think every defense contractor has a different subscription you know, model as far as knowledge. You know, if you're if you're doing a lot of work with the Navy, the Navy's got numerous news outlets and PR. And uh, there's, you know, from a security standpoint, you've got, you know, United States CISA and, and a bunch of other stuff that are putting out free, free information. But I'll tell you, compliance is like the hottest topic right now in the entire defense world. Uh, it's really it's, it's capturing so much attention because it's such a big lift. 
And yet everybody has to do it. Everybody's got to do it. And so as a result, if you can talk intelligently about compliance, you become immediately more valuable and more interesting to the person on the other side of that conversation. You know, sales and, and business is relationship driven. I don't care what anybody says. They want a relationship with you. You want a relationship with them. You don't want them to just buy from you once. You want them to buy from you again. And believe me, they will if they've got a relationship, right? Who do we do business with? We do business with our friends whenever possible. People that we feel comfortable, that we know, like, and trust. So, you know, I think right now, if you're in the defense world and you can intelligently talk about and be an expert at compliance, which I think our YouTube channel does an amazing job of doing, mm -hmm. go check out the YouTube channel, go subscribe to it and just, you know, watch a bunch of videos and, um, you know what else is is just keep an eye out because we're putting out new videos all the time. It is how fast things evolve. And we are trying to be, you know, we are that that level of resource for our clients and our followers. And um, I just generally think that um, right now, your ability to talk about one of the hottest topics, literally, guys, the number one, the number one threat to national security is cyber attack. If you can even talk about that, you're an interesting person in the room. Um, so uh, hopefully, hopefully that helps you out because I'll tell you, being able to just be interesting in a conversation is something that is like, I don't know, it's a lost art, right? Um, I was sitting at, at a table and, and I won't really describe the circumstance in depth, but I was sitting at a table, there were a couple people and like three out of five people just took out their phones in the middle of, of, of this conversation. And it's very off-putting, right? Mm -hmm. That's unfortunately kind of where the world, I think, you know, has gone to some extent. But let me tell you what, those people are not the people who are decision makers. Decision makers have real conversations. People in procurement have real conversations. They want to understand, know, like, and trust who they're sitting across the table from. Because you know what, if there's a problem with that order, they need to know they got a real human being and not a freaking phone on the end of it. So, um, you know, again, I just kind of, I bring it all back to saying, uh, you know, be personable and, and sort of know who the person is on the other side of that conversation. And, I, you know, look, I'm, I'm young, all right. I'm 40. So uh, maybe that's old to some people, but I'll tell you this, I'm old enough and young enough both to know that it's a lot easier to get business done face to face and in person than it is with technology. Now, don't get me wrong. We do a lot of business over the internet, but if you're in person with somebody, your goal is to have them know, like, and trust you. And even if you're in a, a, a virtual call, like we are today, you know, that's about the equivalent of in-person. It's really the technology's gotten that good. So hopefully, hopefully that helps. I was going to say, I think, I think that's the upside of stuff like Zoom calls and video calls is that you can still have that quote unquote face-to-face -face interaction while going for the convenience that the internet provides. So it's this, it's this nice medium of both of those things. And ladies and gentlemen, this question was asked for shameless self-promotion. No, I'm kidding. It wasn't. It wasn't at all. That was a joke. Uh, <laughs> but now, Mike, you know what time it is. Um, it's it's everybody's favorite, the silly question. Um, can I win a defense contract by challenging competitors to a dance-off? I haven't seen it done yet, but I'm not saying it's not. <laughs> but here's what I will tell you, right? So, uh, so it's, you know, where I thought you were going with that is not where you're going with that, which is awesome, which is why I love the silly question. But here's what I'll tell you. What you can do is win defense work without ever bidding on it. And it's called the contract protest. So I know last couple of videos uh, we've been doing, last couple of podcasts, we have been talking in depth about winning, about helping defense contractors to get to that next level they're looking for. Um, and I will share with you one of the most diabolical strategies uh, that we have come up with just to give you a taste of like what it's like working with us. Um, and again, some people call it unethical, uh, but in fact, it, it's actually hundred percent ethical. Uh, here's how it goes, right? We call this, we call this the contract protest strategy. Uh, number one is, is that, you know, obviously when it comes to government contracting, there is a clause that allows you in a lot of cases to challenge the win, say it wasn't competitive, say the other party did not fully meet the obligations of the bid, whatever it may be. There's a lot of different ways that you can actually challenge someone winning a government contract. In fact, I know a lot of companies who never bid on government contracts, they go and wait until it's already won and then they protest them. And when they protest them, they essentially have, instead of a one versus many chance of winning, they have a one-on-one -on -one chance of winning. It's an extraordinarily effective strategy. 
Uh, am I a big fan of it? You know what? I, I'll leave my own personal thoughts out of it because um, business is business and you got to go do what you do. And, and um, you know, I, I think ultimately it is a strategy and that's what I'll provide for you. So uh, with DFARS, particularly, you know, 252.204-7012, it specifically states that you must have the requirements in NIST SP 10171 implemented uh, basically at the time of the solicitation. So if there is a way to challenge that you didn't have those requirements in place at the time of the solicitation, which is, I think, pretty easy to challenge, then you can immediately start a contract protest and really start diving in on the other party. So while you can't win a dance off, you might be able to win a protest is where I'm going. That is a that is a brutal way to win a contract. <laughs> It's really tough. That it's, is a brute. It's like I'm going to wait for everybody else to knock each other out, and then I'm going to knock out the one that actually thought they won. Like that yeah. is that is that's that's brutal. Yeah, that's that, that that that's the tortoise and the hare approach to winning contracts, provided the hare was running against a bunch of other hares, and then the tortoise is just coming walking up at the end. <laughs> yeah, well, patience is key when it comes to government contracting, that's for sure. But uh, again, I, I'll you know. If you've ever worked with us, if you've ever been a client of ours before, you know, particularly, I'll tell you, our, our virtual compliance officer clients, you know, they have their sales teams wind up meeting with myself and some of our other team members pretty regularly because, you know, techniques are always evolving and there's always something else you can do to win a deal. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, I, I don't know, you know, it may not be quite a dance off, but there's a lot of tricks up our sleeve. We've been doing this for a long time. So, uh, it's one of my favorite. Well, it's one of my favorite parts about working with our clients. And again, that's that's definitely a, a more of a feature of our virtual compliance officer program. We do touch on a lot of these techniques in our in our sort of gap analysis and, and solution design programs that we're very famous for. But you know, I would I would really emphasize that um, you know that's those kinds of advanced techniques that can help you win the dance off. Those those are the really good ones, right? So we save those for for uh, for those people who really. Are aggressively looking to grow. I like to uh, I like to mislead with those silly questions. I like to I like to read it as if it's going to be real and then not. But what did you think I was going to ask you when I started that question? Well, I you know I I thought again. So my mind naturally goes to you know the the contract protest because it's one of my favorite techniques. You know, some people are not comfortable with it, and, and I get that. But um, listen, I'm in compliance and my job is to know the rules. It's very much like the tax code, right? Uh, you know, I, I am a huge advocate, pay your taxes, pay every penny of the taxes you're supposed to pay. But, you know, if you read the tax code, there's all kinds of loopholes and, and techniques and things like that. And I'm a rule follower. I mean, that's really what it is, 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 you know, I like to follow the rules and the government has put out as a government does all kinds of goofy rules and I think contract protest is, is, you know, one of the more interesting rules. It's actually designed to keep things fair because, you know, if you got a biased procurement person in the mix, you know, you got to be able to call that out or else you kind of wind up in a situation. Um, you know, I'll give you a great example, right? So like you look at um, some of the oligarchs, if you will, in, in Russia, and you, you look at why they get rich and, and how that works. It's because they gain favoritism with people uh, in the Russian government. And then those people wind up not having to go through a fair and compliant bid process. They just simply get the work because of the relationship with the people at the top. So when you hear about Putin's chef, you know, and things like that, or the fertilizer guy that was in F1, um, that's how that works. And look, that's how they run their country. I got nothing against it. Uh, that's not the American way. The American way is a true attempt at fairness and justice. And I think the contract protest process is exactly that. Um, and you know what, again, if you know the rules, right, that's why they always say, if you get in trouble, you better, you better have a good lawyer. <laughs> so again, our job is to advise defense contractors, educate them on what's possible. And that's exactly what we do. It's brutal, but it, it's brutal, but it's brilliant. I gotta say it's, 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 that's one way to approach it. Yeah. <laughs> imagine, imagine being able to just skip the red tape. And get right to the end when you already know exactly how it's going to be won and then being able to inject yourself. It's incredible. Hey, hey I like it. I like it. <laughs> and that wraps up another great episode of Mission Compliance. We hope our discussion today has provided you with valuable insights, practical strategies, and inspiration to navigate the ever-evolving world of defense, not to mention a particularly brutal and brilliant way to win a contract. We'd like to thank Mike for joining us on this podcast today to, to, to walk us through winning contracts. Thanks, Mike. Hey, it's my pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thanks for putting this on, Roman. But the conversation 
doesn't end here. We, we encourage you to continue exploring these topics and connect with us on our social media channels. Share your thoughts, ask questions, and engage with fellow listeners by using the hashtag Mission Compliance Podcast. You can also visit our website at missioncompliancepodcast.com for show notes, transcripts, and bonus content. If you haven't already, don't forget to hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast platform and be the first to know when new episodes like this one are released. And we truly appreciate it if you could take a moment to rate and review the show. Your feedback helps us continue to bring you thought-provoking episodes and high-quality content. Join us again on the next episode of Mission Compliance as we delve further into the dynamic world of defense, security, and industry innovation. Until then, take care, stay informed, and make compliance your mission. See you next time.